all sorts of folks. You get to, the funny thing is, I think folks that maybe aren't in the industry don't realize that you literally touch every aspect of business across the world, right? I've worked in. Welcome to Beyond Clean with Ace. In the world of commercial cleaning, newcomers and seasoned professionals know we're more than just toilets, windows, and floors. We're just like everyone else with diverse interests in everything. And over the past seven seasons, tens of thousands have discovered engaging, thoughtful, and truly game-changing knowledge here. Whether you're a facility manager, a frontline staff member, or a building services contractor, we're here to help you grow both personally and professionally. So hit that subscribe button and share with others because we're all about enhancing lives in healthy, positive, and proactive ways. Now let's join Dave Thompson, director of the Academy of Cleaning Excellence, your host here at Beyond Clean with ACE. Hello, everyone. Well, you know, it's another episode of Beyond Clean with Ace, where we talk about anything and everything, not just cleaning toilets, washing windows, and doing floors. Although that's probably our main topic. That's what we like to talk about. But, you know, I get to travel all over the world. And this week, of course, as we're recording this today, it's that uh, week of Thanksgiving, which means this is getting close to the end of 2023, and I just can't even believe that already. But hey, here we are, and this is what we're doing. I'm going to bring on somebody else so you don't have to listen to me talk the whole time. I'm sure you'd like that. Niall, I think I can see you. I want to hear you, though. I Can you hear me? I can hear you. That's always good. You know, on a podcast, it's always good when I can hear a voice. Yeah. So, uh, Niles, before we get going into the show here a little bit, tell people who you are, what you do, and maybe a little bit of career about, you know, a little background on who you are. And, you know, I know I've, I found you on LinkedIn, so I know a little bit, but tell the audience what we're talking about. Yeah, wonderful. Well, first of all, I thank you for uh, for having me on. I think this is this is wonderful. I'm, I'm excited to be a, a part of the show here. Um, so, my name is Niles Brightup. And even though my last name looks like something completely different, it's you got to think of it as kind of like light up, bright up, which I, I'm sure I'm probably not even saying my own last name properly, but that just makes it a heck of a lot easier. So, um, yeah, currently I'm, I'm working with um, Marsden Services. They've been just a wonderful company. I'm uh, the national account manager uh, in IFM and overseeing right now um, a pretty, pretty wonderful customer and, and some other sites there and uh, really just working in the IFM side of the business, hard and soft services. Um, but I really got my start on particularly the janitorial side. My goodness, I'm thinking back. I mean, it's it's probably over 25 years ago now. I was a, a young man in high school and my dad uh, was a steel worker actually for 18 years. And he decided to start a janitorial slash maintenance company at uh, 42 years old and while still working at the steel factory and um, and uh, he needed workers, right? And I needed money. So it was it was a great relationship there. Um, but, but, you know, I, the funny thing is I had no idea how large the industry was and the opportunities that the industry presents uh, just because I was, you know, just just working for my father in a small town, Northern Michigan, Northern Lower Peninsula. Um, and, and it was great. You know, it was, I had some pocket money. Um, but uh, I think as, as kids do, I, I said, my gosh, I got to get out of this small town. I want to go see the world. Um, and I ended up joining the Navy. Excuse me. Um, and I was stationed over in Italy. It was amazing. And um, I ended up getting married and having a child and uh, moving back to the States. And I didn't want to be away for six months at a time from my wife and, and my son. Uh, and so I, I just got back into what I knew and that was the janitorial side of the work, the maintenance. Um, you know, it was, I think what was great about that is I, it started as a janitorial company. That's really how my dad's business picked up. However, it moved into the mechanical side and the maintenance side um and and even into i mean goodness demolition and electrical and hvac work and, and the whole nine yards so i learned i learned so much from him and from that experience that i hadn't again I, I had no idea how that would give me opportunities um you know in the world as as a young man with a family at that time so it was it was awesome well excuse me it's awesome now <laughs> it was super great, right? I mean, um, yeah, you're still you're still in it. It came back to it, you know. I, 
I had a colleague of mine one time said, you know, the thing about the cleaning industry is once it gets its hooks in you, it never lets go. Yep. Yep. It, it's a great industry, though. You know what? You, you work with all sorts of folks. You get to... Oh, yeah. The funny thing is, I think folks that maybe aren't in the industry don't realize that you literally touch every aspect of Absolutely. business across the world, right? I've worked in um, cancer centers where you have to get all all smocked up and and yep. and you're literally cleaning air particulates with sticky rollers, right, and things of that nature. Or working in manufacturing plants, um, Greensboro, Ohio. I think it was Ohio where Honda uh, manufactured some of the Honda Civics and, and things of that nature. And we did the cleaning there and, and did some, um, some maintenance work and, and all sorts of stuff. Right. So the, it, 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 the wide range of places that you get to interact with. And not only that, I mean, I had some wonderful opportunities. I did a lot of sports and entertainment work uh, back in, in California. And so um, um, the sleep train arena before, before it became golden one arena, we actually closed down the sleep train arena and within the last, I think it was a week or two weeks, Garth Brooks came and had a concert. And if I remember properly, there was, there was a um, monster truck rally or something. Right. But anyhow, so, you know, he had a concert and then we had 30 minutes to clean this entire stadium and clean up some pretty crazy gross stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But I've done that. The next concert, but, you know, you, especially as a young man back in, you know, my hometown, I never would have thought that I would have that opportunity to, you know, Garth Brooks come walking by and, and smiles and says hello and says, hey, thanks for picking up. And it's like, oh, this is amazing, right? This is so cool. So, oh, uh, I, and, and I can so relate to that, Niles, because as you were saying that, I'm thinking of all the places that my 50 year career in the cleaning industry has taken me. And, you know, uh, I've shook hands with Sam Walton. Um, yeah, you know, hey, never did you, as you said, when I was picking up spit cups in the, uh, uh, the in the gallery at the Cowboys Stadium, I never knew that I would be doing that. And I've even been cleaning with a floor machine on a on the on an airplane wing as it was being manufactured. To yeah. You know, to like you said, I remember the OR room where I'm cleaning a floor and they're actually doing surgery over on the yeah. guy. You yeah. know, and, and, and that is the interesting thing about our, our industry. There, we, we go everywhere. Well, and I think, you know, you know, COVID was horrible, right? It was terrible. There was a lot of really, you know, challenging and crazy things that happened. However, one thing that I think came out of of that whole thing was, and, and I don't say that in a, uh, you know, obviously it was, it was very difficult. So I, I'm not uh, demeaning it in any way, shape or form, but I think something that came out of that was the recognition for the folks on the front line who are keeping places clean and keeping buildings open, open, excuse me, and keeping infrastructure running. Right. And so that there was just this wonderful period of time in that terrible period of time where, the folks that are actually doing this day in and day out and, 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 and behind the scenes and, you know, without recognition often finally had a spotlight and they were, you know, the, the essential folks that were keeping people safe and healthy. And, and not only that, but how some of the processes have changed throughout that and um, almost, you know, how we became a little more introspective into our own industry to make sure that we're actually being proactive, right? To, to, one of the most important parts about it is how, how do you validate clean? How do I know that I'm walking into a building and I know <laughs> that this place is clean, right? And, and, and a lot of the time. Oh, I, I ask that all the time, Miles. Okay, so tell me what clean is. And nobody can. I said it. it's a perception. Clean 100%. is a perception. It's not a reality. Yep. 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 Now, I will agree with you. There are several things that happened during COVID, good, bad, and indifferent. Uh, but... You know, we, I would be remiss, as you said, give frontline people recognition because right now the voting for our national rock star custodian program is going on right now. Uh, mm -hmm. There's about 7,500 votes so far. We we're just three weeks into a two month voting period. So uh, we're getting ready to announce our fifth uh, uh, final or award for uh, the national rock star custodian. So we do that. And one of the things, as you said, you know, I, would you agree with me, and I think you will because of what you said there, Niles, is that 
we are the true first responders. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a story. If only about the world that. woke up to that. So here's a, an interesting, when I first moved out to California, no, forgive me, that wasn't when I first moved out there. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, back in Michigan now. However, um, I was working for the University of California system. I started at Berkeley. And my goodness, that was a three-hour train ride each direction. I used to have to get up oh. at, between 3.30 and 4 in the morning because I lived up in a town called Rockland, named Rockland, forgive me. That's where you, have, where you hope that you can get a, a nap on the train. Well, so if, if you get there in time, and in the very back, there was two seats facing each other, and luckily I was on pretty early, and so you could put your legs up and fall asleep. But here's the But problem. everybody else knew about those, too. Well, not only that, but if you don't wake up at your stop, you end up at the end of the line out in Oakland. And, and you know, that may have happened once or twice, and I may have been late. Luckily, my boss was amazing at the time. Um, oh, but, no, we have stories, though. Uh, it's, you know, but, but and so from that, though, I had, I had um, uh, a team member had reached out from the UC system and said, you know, I know you've got a, a, um, a history in the cleaning business and, and this and that. And so, the environmental services department was looking for a, a sector manager at the time. And so I got to go, uh, I, I transferred over to Davis essentially, started um, as a sector manager on the graveyard shift. And I, I worked in the hospital setting before and, and surgery centers, et cetera. Um, and they were, they were a wonderful group of folks. Anyhow, um, I had some really neat opportunities and I moved into the um, associate director role for the EBS department. But I don't know if you remember, but there was the Ebola scare. I think it was around 2014, 2015. And so I was, on, I, do. I was on several committees. Um, and one of them was the kind of a, a rapid response type thing. And, and so we had this Ebola committee. And, I, you know, I was responsible for taking down this information and then going back and training my, you know, my team and, and staff on, okay, these are the right. process procedures. However, similar to COVID, they changed often. The PPE absolutely during, during Ebola. Ebola, uh, our our uh, PPE procedures of donning and doffing did change because of that. Yep, and, and, and so again, but that's to your point is being on the front line. So, so what ended up happening is we had a um, a person that had came into the ER, and they had traveled from um, you know, out of country and they were afraid that they had Ebola. And so they quarantined, they cordoned off the entire ER. Oh yeah. And I was the only person trained at the time on my team to respond. And so I went in there and I'll tell you what, I, I was, I was super nervous in all honesty. I was super nervous at the time. Uh, and I was, I was wiping stuff down and folks had their phones out and they're, you know, recording all this stuff well, Sure. and my suit ripped. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm fully exposed at the time and I ended up getting, you know, put in, in, in quarantine, quarantine as well. Um, and then come to find out it was a couple hours later that, uh, you know, the, 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 the person in, in question, um, did not have all that, et cetera. But, you know, how often does that happen where folks just don't realize that I think outside of the industry, I think you can talk to anybody in the industry and they can express the importance of, the what the folks in our industry do and oftentimes especially years ago it really wasn't looked at as a, a sophisticated type of a uh, um, industry to be in and and you know it's oh my goodness yeah that we're just we're just cleaning we just need this uh, yeah just we need the floor vacuumed etc um but, in but time it, it, it has been and always will be much more than that and as you said People wake up and realize what the kind of, I mean, ISSA just had their show last week, you know, as we're recording this, uh, you know, we now have robots that scrub floors. And when they first came out, you had to program, you had to empty the water, you had to put water. Now they have filling machines, charging machines. You don't even touch them. Yeah. They, they automatically fill, they automatically empty. The only thing you do is you have to put new pads on it and take care of the squeegee. Uh, you know, but other than that, it takes, you know, I mean, you, you know, it, it's totally different mm -hmm. in some ways. Some ways it's the same, but, you know, as you said, training, you know, I think as you learned, 
we all learned through somebody else, you know, who did, you know, because of what I do now, I teach and that's all I do based on the fact that in the, in the seventies and eighties, when I went into the business, there wasn't anybody that even taught because nobody really knew what they were doing. Yeah. We now have learned all of this. And, and, and to your point about Ebola, if you weren't up with that, you were not the frontline uh, a trained person certified to do that. That is the difference between, you know, most of the people in the cleaning industry and certified personnel. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting to watch the progression of the industry because to your point, I, I, and I think that's such a wonderful point, you know, years and years and years ago, right. It, it, there weren't all these processes and pr procedures, forgive me, set up to where, you can step out and hand it off to somebody else and they can absorb the information, right? Mm -hmm. It was, it was, everybody was kind of, it was a one-off, right? Everyone was, well, this is the way I do it. And hey, when I, when I was going at it, I got to tell you, Niles, the C, uh, um, uh, OSHA was only five years old. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, literally OSHA was trying to figure out what to do. There, there was, you know, you <laughs> think about a five-year-old child, they were just figuring it out what to do. Uh, yeah. so Yeah. I mean, I remember chemical manufacturers bringing product to me and go, tell us if this works or not. So, and, and that's another great one, right? Chemicals, right? And so we've moved from, this, all right, so floor finish, right? I remember literally waxing a floor with Carnuba wax. And, oh, yeah, now, and now that's true wax too. Yeah, yeah, right. We right. don't and use so, wax anymore. We haven't for 60 years, but people still call it waxing. All these the different pile right well and, and the different polymers and the what is it the the zinc metal interlocking polymers that they've come out with now that are incredible and, and we have a, a great lifespan but even moving back into earlier in the industry there was a, a product and i'm not going to call it out but it was oh come on bare bones it was okay it was a floor stripper and it was called bare bones and oh I yeah i know it it was the most incredible floor stripper we did a floor in my hometown it 20 years it hadn't been it hadn't been stripped in 20 years and i remember it, my brother my dad and i um and i think there was one more jump rod rod anyhow so it was you know there was i don't know half inch close to three quarters of an inch of finish on this doggone floor and oh, we yeah. put bare bones down on there and i mean we had to do it in three three passes but it took in three passes it took that much finish off the floor my dad's sitting there with a with a swing machine and trying to hold on but he's slipping all around but the pad had gripped into a portion of the floor but anyhow so oh hey i've had i've had floors where i actually took a a grain shovel you know a scoop shovel oh, of grain, wow. you know base you know that you shovel grain with and we would actually pull the finish and put it into a barrel because you could it, it came up in sheets. You could you could see it. You'd, you'd, you'd pull it. You get the machine, and it just a big sheet would come to it, and just roll up in a big ball. Boy, that would have been that would have made more sense instead of us sitting there like three knuckleheads, you know, early in the business. Hey, hey you 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 live in your I mean, life. Right? If you've been in it long enough, what we're saying, Niles, you've seen all of this, right? My goodness, you, you've seen a lot. You've seen yeah. a lot. But the chemicals now, we have we have so many more safety you know, safety rails, guidelines put in place. Back then, I'll tell you that, that finish would eat your shoe. I would go home at the end of the day and I wasn't wearing boots because I'm, you know, a, a little teenager trying to do this and half my toe is basically eaten off and, and the ink is bleeded into my, bled into my uh, my foot, right? And so, but, but again, this is kind of the progression of the industry where, okay, right. hey, this worked great, but you're probably kind of killing yourself. So maybe we should do something a little different and put these, uh, you know, parameters in place. And, and you know, now we have, I, well, actually, just to go back to the robot robotic piece of it, what an awesome thing. And, and when it first came out, like almost anything, not as reliable, lots of kinks don't work out which is a, a normal kind of life lifeline for, or, 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 you know, process for how this stuff works. I was working with a gentleman, um, and we, we spoke with them very early on when for somatic, the restroom cleaner. Uh -huh. And I remember kind of the first round that came out. Oh, and yeah. now where he's at with this, I mean, it can push an elevator button and go up to its, you know, its own charging station again. Then and I, hey, I remember, 
I remember talking with him and working with him before he went to California with that. And I mean, in very first days of him working it together. And I've been watching that the whole, his whole, uh, uh, you know, progression of it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you know, I was talking with another guy that cleans outdoor buildings, you know, the outside and back to your building facility maintenance, you know, where, you know, he's talking, oh, we clean the outside of the building with drones now. I just saw something about that on LinkedIn. It was yeah, so, so. I mean, you know, this is this is where you're saying, Niles. You know, I think that's the interesting thing, and the reason I love podcasts is because, you know, we get to talk about anything and everything. And so, as you're saying this, all the way from the OR room to a drone watching the outside of the building, we do it. Yep. I mean, literally anything you can think of, you know, it has to be done. Or, or even, you know, if you're talking about the confined space cleaning and cleaning out these large, you know holding tanks for that somebody has to do that right i think if you don't think about the cleaning side of things you don't realize how many facets there are to this industry it's so vast it's so wide and have, it you, all ever, have you ever have you ever cleaned the inside or thought of cleaning the inside of a blood dryer to so know i i never even to say i've never thought of that no no. Nope. Yeah, go to an Oscar Mayer plant and the blood has to be dried to be put into fertilizer. Sometimes something says that thing's got to be cleaned. I've done that. Yeah, that's see that that doesn't sound fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds difficult. That, um, I you know I'm not a huge fan of blood. So, you know. But you but you know all the way from that to the airplane wing, I've cleaned, you know, clean rooms where you go, well, "Wait a minute." But a clean room you know, if they're manufacturing uh, talcum powder and baby powder, there's a room that is special for, and it's a whole different environment. You know, I work with a lady here in Florida now, works with the aeronautics industry. We've got NASA here, you know, with the rockets and everything. Hmm. I guarantee you what, it's a whole other life whenever you go to NASA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, in clean rooms, that's another great side of it, right? So, I, I've done a lot in the GMP it, it, spaces. I, so there was a facility that we took care of that made drug um, drug tests. Uh -huh. And in one of the rooms, I, I, the most insane thing, I mean, they essentially just had cocaine sitting there, uh -huh. you know, not keys and keys and bricks right, and all right, that. Right, right, right. It's, and, and here's the thing, though, is our cleaners have to get access to those areas, right? And so... Literally, they touch every aspect, or even um, you know some uh, um, prisons and and other facilities of that nature. Folks have to go in there and and clean those. I've spaces. done that too. I cleaned the prison cell and taught in prisons. And, uh, I can tell you some stories about cleaning in a prison. That's just oh gosh, man. I would imagine. I would imagine. Yeah, it's you know, it's very and, and, and that's what makes it so much fun. If yeah you like something different. If you're the type of person that likes monotony, nah, there's probably a part of cleaning that could be that way. But typically, even if it's that frontline cleaner doing it every night, there's still a, there's something different every time. Yeah, 100%. Well, here's, you know what, I think part of the challenge to getting folks, <clears throat> recruiting folks into the industry is, is that I, I think oftentimes, Rather, in the past, I think our industry didn't do a great job of promoting the industry and the opportunities <laughs> yeah. that lie within the industry. And so it was almost a defeatist attitude where even, you know, leadership and or, or God, that's probably the wrong way to put it. I, I'll just say the industry in general didn't necessarily talk about the opportunities that that lie within the, the janitorial, IFM, you know, mechanical, so hard and soft services. I think hard services did a much better job because a lot of those trades, um, there's schooling and, and there is a, a career progression kind of put together. The janitorial side, not as much. However, you know, you've got folks that are coming out now and, and even, you know, what you're talking about, the, the you know, nominating the custodians for for these awards and, and showing that, hey, we have, we're investing in you, we care about you. And I think this is a, still a great opportunity for a lot of the big companies out there that maybe don't show that progression in a way that folks can absorb it and say, okay, wait a minute, if I come in and start with your company, you're telling me that 
I can be at a, you know, supervisor, manager, director, VP. I could be the CEO of, you know, X company, or I could learn enough to go out and start my own company. And it's not just going to be a dead end cleaning job. I, I think we need to do a better job about that. But, but there's a lot of folks that are out there, you know, yourself included, that are doing this now so that we are, we're growing our industry with folks that care and, and, and understand that they have a, a career in this. It's not just a dead end, uh, you know, nine to five. And we're the ones that have to take, Naz, you're absolutely right. We're the ones that have to take responsibility for that promotion of our industry because the perception is, and I see these posts, you know, you and I uh, caught up on LinkedIn. And so uh, you watch the posts on social media. He used to be a cleaner and now he's this. Like it's some great big jump from, you know, and it's always that demeaning. Yes. And whenever I, I do my rock star program around the country, you know, I've got 300 custodians out there. And I go, I put the big word custodian on the board and I go, so tell me what a custodian is. And they got start talking about all the things we do. I said, no, 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 no. What's the dictionary's meaning of custodian? What does the word mean? Oh, wait a minute. I said, okay, go janitor. And they don't know that. I said, if we do not know, we do not promote it, how do we expect the general public at large to give us anything different than what they see, what we let them know about? Which is, I mean, look at it. I mean... You know, I'm always dinging people. I did it on LinkedIn three times today already. Why did you show a picture of a sloppy, filthy mop bucket and a mop from the 1400s today? This mm. is not who we are today. Right. Yeah. But yet we keep promoting this same old tired uh, rhetoric. How do we expect anything different? A hundred percent. No, I mean, it's, 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 it's an absolutely perfect point to make. And it's, it's, it's changing even uh, the mindset, our own mindset, quite frankly, because I, I think it's, I think it's very easy to go back into, into a, almost a defeatist attitude about it. Cause, oh my yeah. goodness, you know, this is what people think. So, you know, why the heck are we going to try to do this? I'll just kind of go about my business and Hey, I'm, I'm making a living. It doesn't matter. It's like, no, no, that we, you can't just allow the status quo to maintain and 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 things are going to get better, right? You have to actively go out and promote why this is important, why our industry is important. Again, and, and you're, I mean, you putting podcasts together and and getting the information out there, it's vital, and and I think that draws folks in that wouldn't otherwise have seen or or had an opportunity to listen to a conversation about why. People care about this industry, right? And and the technology and and just how much it has progressed and how things have changed. And where we're I, going. I have the lady that I just got through uh, <clears throat> doing a, um, a voiceover for our podcast, and I met her on LinkedIn. And I said, "Would you do a voiceover?" I sent her the stuff and everything, and she got it done. And and, and folks, you'll hear it. It's the the uh, uh, intro to to this podcast here. It wasn't, but a week after she started sending my podcast out, people's going, I've never heard stories like this. I've never heard things like this. Yep. And uh, so a whole nother group of people. And she goes, they don't talk about just cleaning. Could you believe some of the, and, and she's listening to these stories like you and I are saying, Miles. And I think that's what we need more of. Yeah, I agree. I agree hundred percent. It's, it's it you know not not only just for the the people that maybe don't understand what's going on in the industry, but but really also a lot of people within the industry it, that oh, yes. that can get encouragement from other folks that have gone through similar situations, and and understand the the again the importance in, in what they're doing because it's very easy to get caught in your own bubble and feel like your problems are you're the only person dealing with these types of problems. And uh, and when you hear somebody else kind of maybe voice frustrations, but then also how they've overcome that and the win that they, you know, achieved through, you know, implementing different things, it that's encouragement for other people. I, it, it's, it, which is super important. I, I think the leadership side of our business, again, I, I has done much better and, and, 
Well, it's done much better than it had been in the past. And, I, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to be disparaging in any way, shape, or form. This is just the natural progression of an industry. It's just that, calling the facts what they are, Niles. Right. It's just what it, it is. But, you know, taking care of our our teams and um, um, emphasizing the importance of what's happening. You know, when you scroll through LinkedIn, Facebook, anything at this point, right? right. You see all these posts about, leadership, you know, a true leader, X, Y, Z, and the, you know, the leader, this and that. And, and, and those are great. It's great to post that kind of stuff. So I'm not saying anything negative about that. However, do you take that and implement it in your own business, in your own yeah, life? You're like, you're, you're like me. I, I want to hear some more meat to the matter. You know, don't give me that, that, I mean, it's easy for everybody to repost and like some quote or something. Mm -hmm. I want to see what's going on behind it. Because right. that's the true value of what it is. Uh, you've mentioned this several times. And Niles, as far as I'm concerned with everybody I've talked to, we are in the people business. Cleaning is just what we do. Yeah. Yeah. It's 100%. I, I've told, so one of the things when I've hired folks at, <clears throat> excuse me, manager, director level, anywhere around those, those areas, if, especially if they're not necessarily from the cleaning industry. So I've hired folks from outside of the cleaning industry sure. because they have that personability and, and understand that, okay, this, uh, what you just said, this is a people business. And, and one of the things that I always say is, listen, if, if you can come into the cleaning business and you can be successful for a period of time, grow your business, grow your customer base, you know, maintain your, your core group of employees, there's always going to be a fluctuation here and there then I, I truthfully believe you can go into any other industry and be successful because what you're doing in this business is not just going out and, and sanitizing and cleaning. You're solving problems. You, you know, you're a psychiatrist, you're a counselor, you're a cleaner, uh, you know, I mean, add whatever the heck you want to that. But at the end of the day, what, you know, you're taking care of people's needs. And you have to be able to draw out what they're really looking for, right? And so, I mean, even going into an RFP situation, when you're talking to a potential customer and they have a, a clearly defined SOP and, hey, you know, these are our KPIs that you have to hit, et cetera, et cetera. The way that I think, well, the way that we've been successful in the past with teams and, and I in no way, shape or form take all the credit for any of that is talking to the potential customer and finding out what their real needs are. Why are you going out to RFP? Oh, is it just a timeline thing or is it just a price check thing? Or are you really experiencing some challenges um, that, that aren't being addressed, right? And so when you pull and draw that information out, but you can take that into any other piece of what we're doing. Your employees, you gotta take care of them. You have to understand what's going on with them. Your leadership, you're there to, you know, provide the the uh, what's needed for your leadership to be successful. Your customer, you have to step in and find out what's really the end game that they're looking for. And one of the other things that we always said is, especially your direct customer. My goal, if you're my direct customer, is obviously I want to take care of our our SOP and, and make sure that we're we're maintaining your facility. But I want to get you promoted. I want you to be a rock star, so that. When your boss looks at you, they say, my goodness, you've managed this piece of the business so well, we need you up here. And, and, and again, that allows you to grow in your business alone. But it's just about taking care of folks. We live in such a crazy world at the moment. Lots of negativity, lots of people up, upset and frustrated. You know, we've got to take the other end of it and, and start, start just infusing some good things and positively, positivity and taking care of folks at the end of the day. And, and um, I don't know. I, I think we need to start in our own house, quite frankly. <laughs> well, hey, you know, I think, Niles, we're both talking to the choir here with the two of us because we both believe in the same language here. Uh, you mentioned several times janitorial and uh, FM. So for people that may not know this terminology, uh, could you please let the listeners know why are you separating them? And, and really, what's the difference? Yeah, absolutely. So... The janitorial side of it, really, I just look at that as the custodial, the, the cleaning portion of it and, and the different things that come along with cleaning, right? You're, you're doing floor care, you know, the restrooms, windows, et cetera. So anything that's, that's considered cleaning, the facilities management side of it, 
hard services really is is coming into the mechanical side, um, you know, the maintenance side, electrical. And then you have kind of the overarching FM, which is, you know, the person that's in there managing both of the hard and the soft services side of the business. That's that's kind of the, the quickest way I can break it down. Um, there's, uh, you know, FMs don't kill me, please, because I know there's a whole heck of a lot more that goes into that oh, yeah. kind of side of business, the finance side, and, and um, especially if you're looking at real estate side, leasing, et cetera. Um, but that's kind of how I break it down, right? Soft services being janitorial and, and um, you know, food service can, can kind of go into there. There's different facets to that, hard services, really looking at mechanical and, and soft services, security, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it kind of, it pops around. Um, that was a terrible way to put it, didn't I? I, I didn't. I didn't but, really that's a, but that's okay. But I think, and that goes to the point that I wanted to make and see what your, your version was, because I think this is where a lot of people feel that if they get into janitorial, that it's a dead end. And it really mm -hmm. isn't. And mm -hmm. I, I did another podcast with a gentleman that uh, has been in the janitorial industry for, uh, I think, probably close to 20 years. And he just now has moved into facility maintenance. And he goes, I thought I knew a lot. <laughs> and then I started learning. He yep. said, because now I got to talk to roofers and plumbers and electricians. Uh, he said, I've got building codes and building permits. And yes. he goes, it's a whole different world. So, you know, if you're if you start in janitorial, it doesn't mean you always stay in janitorial. I think that's the interesting thing about this. If you're looking to advance yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and the, yeah, there's there's an entire career in the janitorial side. My goodness. Well, there's but, plenty of people that are just happy just doing what they're doing and forever doing just that. And, and we need and we're built on that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's. Yeah. The, the, On the other the hand, that's where that's where I started, you know, just doing it. I ran my own cleaning company. I sold clean, chemicals for a while and now I travel the world teaching. And, you know, it's like there's where my career of being a cleaners took me. Which which is which is amazing. Right. I mean, I don't know. I just ask this is you're you're the host and you're the podcast. But I, I just want to ask you one question. I mean, you look sure. back at your own career and and the opportunities that you've had when you started in the business, did did you see the, the 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 future for this? Did you see that there was a future for it, or, or you know, well, was I, it just I, I, I think Niles, it progressed as I went along because yeah. you know the thing for me was I didn't think that I would be a frontline cleaner all my life, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but when I started running my own business, I knew that I liked it, but there was a pressure that went along with that. Mm -hmm. and, and and I needed to get away from that. So I, I just said, what can I do with that career that can move me forward? And it just seemed to me that the logical thing would be to go into sales and marketing of the tools and, and, and supplies. So while I was doing that, then I kept looking at it going, what is the industry still lacking? And it mm -hmm. goes back to what we've said here today. I didn't know what I was doing. And most of the people that I've worked with, or my, they just learned from somebody else who didn't know what they were doing. So then I just started using all of my clients as a research lab. And I started developing courses that basically answer two questions. Why am I doing what I'm doing? And am I getting the results I want? Mm. When you ask yourself the hard questions, then I developed whole all of the training that I do now and all of the education I do now. So what I do now is I take that education all over the world and say, think of it this way. I'm not married to any manufacturer, any process, any yeah. organization. I look at it because it's from the frontline user's viewpoint. Yeah. Why am I doing what I'm doing? And does it get what I want? Again, if I'm not happy with the answer, Again, though, to the point that you just made, I think is is incredibly important. It's not pontificating down, right? You're you're taking the information from the ground Correct. up, which Correct. absolutely for for something to be adopted, <clears throat> people have to be able to answer the questions that that you just stated. I and I I think this again, it's an opportunity for folks in the industry, for leadership in general, to hey. 
you need to garner that information and that relationship with the folks on the front line if you want some, anything to be successfully implemented. Anybody can throw the hammer down and say, hey, this is how you're going to do it. This is what you're going to do. Yep. Yep. Not provide the background or, or why it's important. It'll be successful for a period of time. You'll wash out a lot of folks. But when you do it the way that you're talking about, there is real sustainable change that can happen. And all that does is not only does that benefit the industry, but that takes care of the frontline folks. And that, that again, it's, it's that encouragement thing. I talk about that a lot, but it's, it's so important to me, the, the people aspect of our business, of any business mm -hmm. for that matter, but really this business. And the re reason I say this business is because again, I think janitors and, and I, and specifically the janitorial side, but janitors, for, for a long time in the past, especially, were really just looked at as non-essential, as interchangeable, right. as an unimportant task. It doesn't matter. You know, we can find anybody to do this. All you need is a broom and a, a dustpan and a mop. And my goodness, everything's clean. As long as it smells good, it's clean, right? It's like, my goodness, <laughs> no. the way it works, right? But hey, if the floor is shiny, it's clean, right? Nope. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, so forgive me. I got to take a drink real quick here. I'm talking too much. I'm, I'm drying my throat out here. Um, <laughs> That's all right. That means they're listening to you, not me. <laughs> well, yeah, then I need to, I need to step back a little bit. No, 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 no. That's quite all right. You'll go right ahead, Niles. It's, 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 you know, taking care of our people and the people that are out there making things happen is unbelievably important and necessary. And, and again, I, it goes right back to what you're saying you know, listening to folks in the front line, it, you can, you can make any business business successful, right? You have to understand the finance side of it. You have to understand the administrative side of it. You have to understand the technical side of it, et cetera. But what makes all this happen, unless it's fully automated, is the frontline folks and the people out there, the grunts getting the work done. I've been a grunt. I've done it. I've worked for some incredible, wonderful bosses. I've worked for some really difficult folks <laughs> um, and and you learn a lot right oh yeah but one of the things that i got from all that is you got to take care of the people that are doing the work and they will literally make you successful successful you've got to hey, listen you've got to watch the top end here there are certain things that are very important about maintaining this success and being financially responsible and and being on the cutting edge of technology etc all very incredibly important things, all as important. But if your folks aren't there and they're not fighting for you, they're they're fighting against you. That's just the way it is. It, it's it's. I got a feeling that you and I could stand here and talk for hours on end. I, I have that feeling, you know. And that's an interesting thing, Niles. You know, everybody comes on the show. What are we going to talk about? And here we are, <laughs> forty five minutes later, going. When am I going to shut up? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I talk a lot. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a gabber. <laughs> Folks, I got to tell you, it's so interesting from this side. I hear so many people going, you know, what are we going to talk about? I don't know. And I go, hey, hey, uh, we're, we're up against the 45 minute clock here, guy. You know, yeah. really? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, been, it's fun. It's, it's been good. It's been a great conversation. I really enjoy. Again, I, I really appreciate you, you, you know, allowing me the opportunity to chat with you and, and, um, I'm not so let me let, before before I get rid of you before I let you go. I got to ask a couple. I got a few questions. I'm still going to have to ask. Okay. What has been the best? I mean, you know that one best story that you just you know you're always going to remember. Oh boy. Okay, so maybe while you're thinking about that, what's the worst one? <laughs> is that wow. is that one easier to come up with? You know, there are there are some great examples on both ends. Okay. I, I would say the best one is I think it's a it's a it's a bunch of stories put together, and that is how much I have gotten to experience and see working in this business. And that goes back to the beginning of our conversation. I've I've worked in some insanely scary, crazy places, steel factories where they're pouring big, you know, giant kettles of iron and things oh, of that gosh. nature yeah. to the clean rooms that we had spoken about, uh, OR cleaning, where, again, 
Yeah. At, at Davis, the ORs went down and we had to get in there because all the HVAC system turned back on and all their, you know, the stuff's flying in. Again, the, the OR clean team and our team went in and saved the day for those folks so people could maintain, you know, and stay operating. So it's hard for me to pick out one story. I, so I have to look at my career and the opportunities as a whole. And that is I've worked with some amazing, incredible people. And the success that I've had is really because I've worked with, with awesome teams that have just put in so much effort. And, and I, I, I want to share that, that wealth with them as well. And, and um, so that's, you know, I think the credit goes to those folks. Uh, that would be my best story. The worst story, my goodness, that's a tough one. I would say at the beginning of my career, um, when I was quote unquote toilet boy uh, working under my brother, there was a <laughs> there was a notable restroom in a um, construction uh, uh, supplies facility that had to be cleaned every night. And I don't know how to put this, so I'm going to be very gentle. Um, there was spray all over the walls, up into the ceiling, and this was an everyday thing. And I was the youngest and the newest, and so I got to go in there with a toilet brush and uh, a pair of kitchen gloves and um, and some bleach, actually, back in the day, which is a big no-no, but this yeah, is... I, I, it's what we did. So, yeah. Oh, I could tell some stories, but folks, you've already probably heard mine if you listen to any of my podcasts. <laughs> so, you know what? I'm not going to go into my stories. Um, you know, I think that's the interesting thing. You know, dirt is our life. Without dirt, we have no business. But I've never been a day without a job. Yep. And a good one to boot. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I'm like my, my mentor said, you know, I, I can never get away from the cleaning industry. I love it. I know what uh, I know what I do. You know, I think you'll agree with me, Niles. We have no idea of the positive impact we've had on thousands of lives. Hmm. Hmm. That's important. Yeah. How, what other industry can we really say that? I mean, yes. I mean, people use a lot of the things that people manufacture and stuff. But, you know, I, I, I have a saying. It's a trademark phrase that I coined some years ago. I am a janitor and I save lives. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah, it's so true. Again, it goes back to take care of your folks. They touch, again, they touch every aspect of every business, the CEO, down to the barista, down to the cleaner, you know, to the, the accountant, et cetera. If your team is happy and they feel empowered and encouraged and they have the tools to do their job, that translates to other folks. And, and, and you know, I think that's what we're in the business of, lifting people up and, and cleaning toilets. I'm fine with it. There was your closing statement. I appreciate it. I have two questions before you go. Where were you born? I was born in Traverse City, Michigan. Ah, Michigan born and back there again. Yep, yep, back, back uh, to the hometown, yeah. Well, we're getting ready to get into 24 here pretty soon, so I'll ask it this way. What is on your personal, not business, but personal bucket list for next year? Hmm, my personal bucket list, number one, I have to get my motorcycles up and running again because I've been here for a year and I didn't get on, you know, I didn't get to ride that much at all. Uh, uh, I've got some work to do. And um, gosh, number two is honestly just spending more time with family. That's why we moved back to town. And um, uh, I've been gone for 20, again, 20, I left in 2000, so 22 years. Um, <laughs> so just being with family, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of what happens. You get older and you start realizing what's really important and, uh, so that, that would be it. Well, I have to say, I got rid of my motorcycles at at, uh, at this point in my life, but I got an electric bicycle now. So I'm kind of, I'm a little bit further than the pedal power, but not quite to that uh, motorcycle you still, but. Those still go fast, by the way. The, oh yeah, I, gar I guarantee you, I was up to 23 miles an hour on it this weekend. And I'm like, uh, that's that that's enough on those little thin white wheel. And that, that's, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree. You know what, folks, as I ask those questions, there is a reason that I ask those questions, and you might wonder what that is. If you've been on the podcast before, you probably already know. If this is your first podcast here at Beyond Clean with Ace, well, I'm going to tell you. 
We now know that Niles was born in Michigan and Andy's returned. We know that he married somebody in Italy and he's got a kid. We know all of these things. All right, fine, great. We know that he's been a cleaner. We know what he's been doing. We don't know if he's going to get those motorcycles fixed next year or not, but he's got to go. Why am I asking this? Because what I want you to do between now and the next time is make sure that you keep your life healthy, positive, and proactive. Until we meet again, stay healthy out there, folks.